Hello, everybody. Please sign in the chat. Just say hi. Okay, some of my usual suspects are already signing in. Okay, got about 10 people so far. I would say good morning. I think it's technically still morning for a few more seconds. Monique, Scarlett, David signed in. Hello. All right, we've got a raised hand. Okay. Hi, Cam. Okay. Well, it is 1201. So I want to officially welcome everybody to the session of the community table. And our topic today is serving the aging homeless. And our presenter is from the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council at Devorah Keller. And they've done wonderful work with us in the past. So uh, I have no doubt that this one will follow suit. And so I'm not going to waste any more of everybody's time, and I'm going to turn it over to Devorah. Thank you so much. I am so excited to be here with you today. As um, I was introduced, my name is Devorah Keller. I am the Director of Clinical and Quality Improvement at the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council, and I'm delighted to um, talk with a group today about supporting older adults experiencing homelessness. I hope this will be um, an interactive session, so please feel free to um, put any questions in the chat. Um, I'll keep an eye on it, and I'll also pause during the presentation to see if there's questions as we go along on this journey together. At the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council, we are acutely aware of how historic inequities underlie and continue to contribute to the drivers of poverty and homelessness. As such, I like to begin all of my talks with a land and labor acknowledgement in the hope that acknowledging this history will support work to create a more equitable future. So, um, to, since our conversation today includes individuals from um, many communities, um, and we're in a virtual space, um, we are all interconnected by the land beneath us. Most of our communities reside in unseated, and unseated ancestral lands. We acknowledge the people of these lands, past and present, and honor with gratitude the land itself and its people. We also honor the brilliance and humanity of all immigrant labor, including voluntary, involuntary, trafficked, forced, and undocumented people whose whose work remains hidden in the shadows, but still contribute to the well-being of our collective community. So today we're gonna to talk about older adults and the age cutoff for older adults varies depending on the definition that um, you're using. In the United States, older adults are often identified as individuals who are 62 or 65 and older, and often it's in direct relation to services or benefits that someone might get when they reach that age. However, and I'm sure many of you who um, in the audience um, are acutely aware of this from the work that you do, adults experiencing homelessness often experience geriatric conditions which we'll describe shortly, 15 to 20 years earlier than their house counterparts. Because of this, for the purpose of today's talk, I'm gonna use a cutoff of 50 or 55. Um, I'd ask you to think of that age group when we're talking about older adults. In today's talk, 
um, I'm going to um, try to touch on these three objectives. And my, my goal is really to, to make the topics we talk about today um, tangible, helping people understand the challenges people face, as well as things we can actually do to support people with these challenges. So my objective is at the end of this talk, I'm hoping you can describe three ways that premature geriatric conditions impact older adults experiencing homelessness. I'm hoping you can describe three um, strategies that direct service providers can use to support older adults experiencing homelessness, and also explain and consider implementing at least two best practices that your program can do to improve support for older adults experiencing homelessness. As introduced above, people experiencing homelessness um, experience early aging, and this is often through the accumulation of premature geriatric conditions. And geriatric conditions are a collection of medical and functional conditions um, that include functional impairment, cognitive impairment, visual impairment and changes, hearing impairment and hearing loss, incontinence and falls. And together, these um, constellation of syndrome of, of experiences and syndromes um, lead to increased vulnerability and decreased independence. People experiencing homelessness are more likely to have geriatric syndromes at any age compared to their age max match peers. And as I mentioned in the last slide, they're likely to develop geriatric syndromes 15 to 20 earlier, 20 years earlier than um, individuals in the general public. And at the same time, the experience um, that people have when they're um, when they're unhoused um, impact the ability to navigate these geriatric symptoms. So restricted environments impact self-care. So for example, shelters that have um, limits around what kind of activities and what services are available and what physical, um, the built physical environment. Um, and this impacts people's abilities to care for themselves and also care for their health um, through any sort of health management activities that they may have that they need to do to, to take care of themselves. And in addition, um, individuals who are, are unhoused, they're less able to adapt their environment. They don't have control over um, what um, physical supports they have and um, changing the environment to accommodate their needs. So for example, someone who, who's housed who may need to newly need to use a wheelchair or a walker, they can put in a ramp to help them get into their home. But if someone's in a shelter, um, a shelter system, they may not have the agency, the ability to change the structure of, of their built environment to allow them to um, be able to move freely. And paradoxically, as a result of all of these vulnerabilities, older adults who are experiencing homelessness with geriatric conditions end up having higher rates of unsheltered homelessness because the systems and the um, supports we have in place have not been designed to support their needs. Taking a closer look at the state of older adults homelessness, you know, like um, the general um, population of unhoused individuals, older adults experiencing homelessness are split into two categories, those experiencing chronic homelessness, um, uh, and that is defined as um, individuals who are homeless for at least 12 months or longer, or four separate occasions within three years that um, equal up to a year, or individuals who are being or who are homeless for the very first time. And of the full population of people experiencing homeless, greater than one in five people are 55 or older. So a really large pop part of the homeless population is, is in this older adult population. And this is also the this is also the fastest growing age group within the overall population. And you know, that mirrors in some ways um, the aging population in general. And the, this is also a population of um, individuals who are aging in to chronic, in, into this age. So people who have been chronically homeless and started to be chronically homeless at a young age are now aging in to this older adult population. So they were young and homeless and now they're older and chronically homeless. But at the same time, 30 to 50% of individuals who are homeless in this age group, they're experiencing homelessness for their very first time. So this is a really a heterogeneous population of older adults. Some have been homeless for many, many years, and some 
have had, and we'll talk about the drivers of homelessness, but some people are having um, experience are, are experiencing homelessness for the very first time after um, a lifetime of, of having greater stability. And as I mentioned in the last slide, and for complex reasons, more than half of the people who are, who are over 55 who are homeless are unsheltered and not staying within the shelter or other um, indoor temporary systems. So when we think about what's driving this epidemic of older adults experiencing homelessness, it's in many ways the same thing that drive homelessness in general. The lack of affordable and accessible housing is number one, two, and three on my list always. And in the older adult population, that question of accessible housing, um, not just affordable housing, really rises to the top of, of my areas of concern. And then, um, you know, other things that um, that lead to um, first-time homelessness in this population, um, restricted income or loss of work, resulting in someone then losing um, losing their financial security, and resulting in losing their housing. Um, many people live on limited or fixed incomes, um, uh, you know, an SSI or um, a pension, and um, then the cost of living increases around them in um, rising uh, housing costs. Someone might have lived in the same house for. 30 years and all of a sudden a new developer purchase the purchases the building and raises the rent. They can no longer fix afford to live in what was their home for the past three decades. Um, for many people, a death of a spouse or divorce or another change in family structure might um, lead them to um, experiencing homelessness. This That other person was responsible for the finances, family strife after a parent passes away, um, uh, where someone was living with them for their whole life. These are all um, sort of moments of crises that may live someone, lead someone who's older to be homeless for the first time. And then finally, a health condition or a disability um, and needing to sort of balance um, paying or taking care of one's health or paying um, for rent um, could um, lead someone to become homeless for the first time. Oh, and this, oh, sorry, this is, I did not. Okay. Um, and this just gives us a little schematic of thinking about a health condition um, leading to someone um, uh, experiencing homelessness. So we have someone starting um, with a lower income, but making making it work, um, uh, being able to afford um, their rental unit or their home, and then they have a significant health event. And because of that health event, they miss work, um, they um, lose their job, they're not able to go back, um, they have really um, high uh, medical bills that they need to pay, um, and that results in them losing their housing. And then um, all of a sudden, at, at the age of 60, they're experiencing their first um, their first experience of homelessness. When we think of um, older adults, there are also some unique challenges that this population faces when trying to move out of um, homelessness. And, you know, the first one is that a lot of the homeless response system was developed and um, initially to cater to, to younger populations that um, don't have the same level of um, complex um, needs and disabilities. So um, things like services that haven't actually been created to support people with mobility or functional or cognitive support needs. Um, another really big one um, that has come up in, in a number of interviews that we've done with, with both um, people with lived experience as well as service providers is that limited technology literacy really impacts this population. Well, it used to be that you could put your name on a list, you could um, uh, you know, show up to an office to to request services, you could make a phone call. Now with um, complex um, phone trees and um, for many services, the only point of access is through the computer and through a technologic um, uh, pathway. And, and it really makes it harder for individuals with limited technolo technology literacy to access the services they need. Um, as we talked about before, fixed incomes and the inability to sort of shift or change that income because of the inability to work more. And then I really want to highlight this one, especially to a group of um, service providers, that there really has been a, a historic siloing of older adult services sort of in one bucket and then homeless response services in another bucket. And the two are not necessarily um, intertwined. Um, and often um, there's lack of understanding, lack of collaboration, or 
or even just not lack of knowledge of what might exist in the same community. And then the final one that we'll get touch on a couple of times is that for older adults who need additional support services, for those with substance use or mental health support needs, there often isn't a location that's been designed and uh, that is willing to accept someone who is still who are still at a place um, in their substance um, use journey that they're that they're not interested in cutting back on their use or locations that have the additional mental health support that someone might need to succeed in a um, indoor sheltered or community setting. So we're gonna jump in um, in a minute to looking at some of these needs um, uh, broken down. Um, and I wanted to start this section by just sharing a quote from one of my uh, former colleagues and um, uh, a geriatrician who works um, at UCSF. And when I asked her, um, you know, what do you think are the unique needs of older adults experiencing homelessness? She shared that, there's a degree to which the health and social support needs aren't different in character or in quality than the general older adult population, but they're hugely unmanageable in a scenario where you don't have a you don't have stable housing, safe access to a support person, and those things that help you manage your chronic conditions. So many of the needs that we're going to talk about are needs that many older adults have, but the setting in which older adults experiencing homelessness have them and the lack of supports they have to take care of themselves is, is what drives so many of the difficulties and complications. So, so I'm now gonna walk through some of the geriatric conditions that I introduced at the beginning of um, the talk and um, try and highlight what some of the um, the specific challenges that um, people who are experiencing homelessness who are older might face, and then try to offer some suggestions um, and best practices that um, folks can implement to try and support individuals with these challenges. So functioning is um, really a dynamic interaction between a person's health conditions, environmental factors, and their own personal factors. And so what I wanna highlight about this is that functioning is really a dynamic interaction between someone's skills and health needs and the environment that they're in. And with sort of adaptive um, devices, someone who has a hard time functioning in one way um, might be able to actually succeed in that way. So it's both skills as well as the environment and how those two intersect with each other. So um, in, in practice, we tend to talk about functional categories as ADLs, activities of daily living, and IADLs, instrumental activities of daily living. And the main ADLs are things like bathing, toileting, dressing, feeding oneself, functional mobility, the ability to sort of um, transfer between locations and walk around one's personal space and personal hygiene. And, um, and IADLs are things like community mobility, the ability to get to an appointment by um, navigate the bus system or, um, or transport by car, financial management, meal preparation, so either cooking or being able to order in food or um, get food from uh, outside location, safety management, so being able to figure out, oh my goodness, my my um, stove is on, I need to shut that off before I go to sleep so there's not a fire, being able to shop for oneself and then being able to communicate one's needs um, to other people. And so as people age, they may start to develop um, challenges in, in one or many of these spheres. And there are some unique functional challenges that people who are unhoused um, experience. And one of, you know, the first one is, is really the lack of accessible shelter placements um, and the ability to use, um, use the shelter um, and the service system that's in place. And that is because oftentimes the sleeping arrangements aren't designed for someone who has a hard time transferring, who can't be on a top bed, who um, isn't able to um, to navigate between rows of 
bunks. Um, bathrooms often don't uh, haven't been designed to support people who need um, uh, more space for transfers. Um, shelters aren't necessarily created with um, a lot of um, private or safe spaces for someone to engage in health care management. Um, uh, things like um, uh, changing ostomies if someone has um, an ostomy, doing um, one's own wound care. And in settings where someone doesn't is not able to practice those things independently, over time as someone ages, those skills can actually atrophy and um, wither if people are not engaging in, are limited in the self-care that they can engage in. Another big functional challenge that people have um, is um, transportation and navigation challenges. Oftentimes, um, social services, health services, housing services are scattered around a community and the ability to navigate between all of these different places to be able to um, access the sort of constellation of services people need um, is limited by these navigation and uh, community mobility skills. Um, in addition, oftentimes people, as I was saying at the beginning, functioning, Functioning is this um, interplay between skills and the environment. And often when someone is unhoused, they um, have a lack of access to durable medical equipment and adaptive devices that could help them succeed and be independent in another place. So from the inability to have a place to store one's um, wheelchair to um, grab, to having installed grab bars in all the places they needed, to having a, a grabber that doesn't get lost, that they're able to um, carry around with them. A number of these adaptive devices, devices that might help someone be able to transfer, to address themselves, to um, communicate with others um, are harder to come by um, and harder to um, hold on to when someone is moving around and they're unhoused. And then I wanna um, just acknowledge that there's a bi-directional impact of functional impairment and behavioral health symptoms. And often if someone is depressed, they have a harder time taking care of themselves. But if someone has a hard time taking care of themselves, and they wish they could, they can become more depressed or their mental health symptoms, their behavioral health symptoms may get exacerbated. So there's really a, a really intimate connection between functional impairments and, and behavioral health sim um, symptoms that, that can be cyclical and, and self-perpetuating. So what are some um, on the ground things that we can do both on the program level and on the service provider level to support people who are developing functional impairments? So on the program level, um, you know, as a, as a program, you can really try to um, think about how um, people access your services and make sure that accessing services are easy to navigate. And that could mean having um, sort of an open model without sort of really rigidly structured hours, um, making sure that people are a bit able to access you through the phone, through drop-in, through a variety of different ways. Um, and also thinking about clustering services in a centralized location so to take away that barrier to navigation that people can sort of go to all show up and get multiple services at the same place. Another, um, you know, sometimes expensive, but really helpful one is integrating those environmental modifications, making sure that um, that signs are big, that you have um, a hearing, um, that you have pocket talkers or a way to communicate with people who might be hard of hearing, that um, there are ADA beds and showers and grab bars in, in the bathroom, things that, um, that things are brightly, um, lit so that people have an easier time navigating if they have some visual issues. And then embracing trauma-informed care strategies um, really allow people to um, feel more comfortable in asking for help when they need it. On the service provider level, um, and, and this is, you know, I'm, I, I know that, um, taking a step back, all of these um, suggestions are designed for individuals supporting people experiencing homelessness, no matter their background. And so um, this um, these suggestions um, work for someone who might be a clinical provider or um, a case manager, a peer, um, someone who's working in sort of the administrative um, side of things. So this is sort of uh, designed to be um, suggestions that, that are applicable broadly to all service providers um, caring for people and supporting people experiencing homelessness. 
all of us um, can assess for functional limitations and challenges with um, navigation and can pay attention to when someone's having a hard time and whether or not we need to advocate for them to have additional support or durable medical um, uh, equipment. Um, and then we can, you know, service providers can bridge technology gaps and can sort of fill in that piece of someone having a hard time accessing services, um, making it through the process of a housing application because there's technology expectations. And the final, um, a final thing that we can do is really advocate for those functional assessments and modifications when, when a client is going into housing or going into a program so that we can make sure that they can succeed there um, and can we can try to make sure that they have that that they're going to succeed by bringing up these needs and advocating that they get met before someone transitions into a place where they then um, might be struggling. So I'm going to pause for a minute and see if anyone has any questions um, uh, up so far before I move into the next section, which is going to be a look at um, cognitive decline. Okay, I'll, I'll keep on going, but please um, put any questions you might have in the chat. Oh, um, I see Scarlett is asking going what fu what functional assessments mean um, again. Yeah, I think that that's a great um, uh, a great question. So um, a functional assessment is you know so I think that depending on. Um, okay, so a functional assessment is usually something that's done um, by, um, by a clinician, so an OT, a PT, a physician, um, that can tell us what sort of support someone might need. Um, like, do they need a cane? Do they need a wheelchair? Do they need grab bars? Something of that sort. So it's often, and some, so that's sort of on the most um, advanced level, but there are some ways in which we in the community can do some functional assessment by noticing, does someone have a hard time transferring in and out of their bed? Does, is someone having a hard time with their stairs? Um, is someone look like they, um, is someone having a hard time hearing? Um, and I think maybe they have a hearing impairment that needs um, to be um, to, to be addressed. So um, really it ranges, um, when I when I use that, I, I think that there's ways in which community-based providers can do, can, can observe what they're seeing and share that with, um, with a, um, a clinician, or they can advocate that this person actually has a full formal assessment, usually from a physical therapist or an occupational therapist that lets us know what um, services they might need. And, and those resources are not available everywhere. So um, really, um, I think observation in the community um, is, is the key first step. Um, and then um, if you're able to get more formal assessment, if you're really worried about someone, that's, that's super helpful. Does that help, Scarlett? Great. Okay, so the, the next um, one of the um, geriatric syndromes that we're gonna look at together is, is cognitive decline. And cognition is um, really is, is the way that your um, brain is able to process um, information and use it out in the world. And cognition can be split into like a whole bunch of different um, categories. And I think oftentimes we think, oh, cognition is like, can I remember things? But really cognition um, and the way that cognition um, supports activity in the world is, is um, cut into these different um, spheres or domains. And um, it's helpful to just have a sense of what they are when you're working with someone. You're like, they don't, they seem like they're not themselves, but I'm not sure um, exactly in what way. And so the main, some of the main domains of cognition are attention. So can someone engage in a conversation in an activity without getting distracted? Memory, can someone remember who you are? Can they remember um, where they're supposed to go? Can they remember um, uh where they live, um, things of that sort. Executive functioning is the ability to um, to follow a set of steps um, to, to get an activity done and to also be able to do things like safety planning. Um, and um, you know, do, do people remember not to walk into the street, the process of cooking and then shutting off and cleaning their dishes, things that involve sort of higher level um, sequential safety steps. Um, speech, the ability to to 
make sure that their needs are known, visual perception to be able to see around them and interpret that information, and then praxis, the ability to um, to do activities. For example, you know, in the health sphere, like the ability to um, be taught and then implement the giving oneself insulin um, or taking uh, opening up a uh, bottle and taking pills or um, you know, even the steps that it takes to sort of get dressed, that that is praxis, that is um, sort of uh, action steps that follow a sequence. So people experiencing homelessness have higher rates of cognitive impairment um, and some of the conditions that um, that lead to um, cognitive impairment. And that includes chronic health conditions like poorly controlled high, high blood pressure, um, diabetes, other um, chronic medical conditions that um, impact over time the brain and lead to cognitive impairment. Um, people experiencing homelessness have really high rates of traumatic brain injury, and over time, traumatic brain injuries can lead to, um, to, to premature cognitive impairment. And then both behavioral health conditions and substance use disorders um, are can lead to premature cognitive impairment. And with behavioral health conditions, um, sometimes um, as someone ages, um, dementia and other uh, forms of cognitive impairment are part of the disease process. And at other times, some of the medications that we use can have um, impact on, um, on cognitive health as well. And then substance use disorder, um, substance, uses, substance use, especially alcohol, over time can um, impact someone's cognition. Um, and secondarily, some of the brain injuries that can be associated with things like non-fatal overdoses or traumatic brain injuries in the setting of intoxication. Those are all um, contributing factors to the high, high rates of cognitive impairment in people experiencing homelessness <coughs> compared to their um, to uh, peers um, the same age. And so People who are unhoused experience some unique challenges because of um, the setting. You know, they can have difficulty navigating healthcare and housing systems. And really important to point out that cognitive impairment leads to an increased risk of um, victimization for all older adults. But it's really uh, that risk is even higher for those who are unsheltered and those who are um, uh, experiencing homelessness. And then when you're trying to um, think about options for housing for older adults, for those who have cognitive impairment who you think may need extra support, there are really, um, there are fewer options that are available um, for individuals um, for rehousing in a, for housing in a, in a setting that might provide them the additional support they need. Um, and because of that, individuals with cognitive impairment often remain homeless longer. And that could be due to lack of appropriate options or the challenges in navigating the system um, uh, to, to exit homelessness. So here are some strategies that we can do to support individuals who are um, experiencing homelessness and have cognitive impairment. So the first one is to integrate screening for cognitive impairment into your multidisciplinary workflows and into non-traditional settings. And I have here on the side, this is um, the Montreal Cognitive Assessment, the MOCA. There are a number of um, uh, screening tools. Um, there's also um, something called a GPCOG that can um, that that people can be trained to do and um, can help identify if someone um, may be experiencing cognitive impairment. And this can be then used to, to sort of advocate for further um, for further uh, workup and screen, screening. And I would say that a lot um, further workup and um, treatment options. And I would say a second thing is that oftentimes um, people say, oh, someone is um, experiencing cognitive impairment and there's nothing to do about it. That's not actually um, true. And I really um, encourage um, folks when, when you are partnering with healthcare systems to really advocate for cognitive testing and for workup of underlying causes, because sometimes causes of, um, of cognitive impairment are reversible and 
um, specific strategies um, can be used when we know where someone needs the most help. Is it that they have a hard time with memory? So then really we should be offering support around reminder systems. Are they having a hard time with, um, with community navigation? Can we per put extra support in, in place around that? And knowing where someone's impairments are can really help figure out what, um, what types of services could be helpful. And um, Another thing that um, we can do to support people with cognitive impairment is I really encourage everyone, no matter um, everyone, no matter um, their background, to really engage with individuals in advanced care planning discussions and the importance of helping people to try to identify trusted surrogate decision makers. And this process of asking people what's important to you. Who would you want to help you if if um, you, you had a hard time making decisions for yourself? Um, you know, as community support providers, oftentimes when someone is no longer able to share those things directly with um, with providers, it's the um, their community supports, um, their case managers, um, the peers that knew them, um, maybe their primary care doctor who can speak and say this is what was important to this person before um, they had a hard time telling us that. And that can be really important to, to make sure that um, as someone ages, um, that that what was um, that their priority and who, what they cared about most is translated forward. And then to really share observations about changes in behavior and memory with any clinical partners and within your team so that you can brainstorm together how to keep someone safe um, in, their, in their setting. I'm gonna move along to complex medical needs, but I wanted to take a pause and see if anyone had questions about the cognitive, about cognitive impairment um, and, and strategies of, of what, we, what we want to look for and, and, and things we can do in the community. I'll keep moving. Where could we find a copy of the Montreal assessment? If you Google search MOCA, um, Montreal or Montreal Cognitive Assessment, but I can, um, after, during the q and I can um, put a link in the chat as well. So complex medical needs. Um, so um, in addition to all of the challenges and needs that people experiencing homelessness have um, in general, no matter the age range, as older adults, as people get older, um, they have more complex medical needs. And as I had said at the beginning, people who are experiencing homelessness often have met um, complex medical issues that are advanced for their age um, and um, you know, are experiencing complications of that individuals who are 15 to 20 years older than them may um, may have from the same medical condition. And at the same time, then they have all of these other um, complicating factors with functional impairment and premature cognitive impairment. And that makes it more difficult to engage um, in um, and health management tasks. And some of the health management tasks that someone who has complex medical conditions may need to do includes following a, a medication, a recommended medication schedule if someone is interested in taking medications, attending appointments maybe with, you know, frequent appointments with one's primary care doctor or with specialists, following diet recommendations in a very restricted environment, um, following um, physical therapy or activity recommendations, walk on this, uh, you know, walk more or don't walk on that leg, there's an injury, um, and then healthy sleep, which really is so important for mental health and physical health in general. Um, as I said, um, older adults have earlier onset of chronic medical conditions and they have advanced and premature complications of, of um, chronic medical conditions. And compared to their age match peers, they have increased um, mortality and higher rate of death. So here are some strategies. Oh, 
Oh, thank you so much, RC, for sharing the Montreal assessment in the chat. Um, here are some strategies that we um, that we can use both on a program level and on a service provider level to support individuals with complex medical needs. So, on um, the program level, um, you know, having care coordination and outreach teams um, that can help folks navigate um, the. Uh, both social service and healthcare um, appointments and systems, um, and advocate on someone's behalf, be that that extra voice, that that organizer, that um, highlighter of key information, is really um, is is a program level intervention that you can do if you're supporting a lot of older adults experiencing homelessness. And but not every organ, not every program has um, staff members who are able to do that. So alternatively, considering partnering with organizations that do have outreach services. And then finally, partnering and making relationships with home-based services. A lot of times in certain jurisdictions, things like in-home health support or um, home caregivers um, aren't available to people who are experiencing homelessness. But those are services that can be really helpful, even if someone's in the shelter system, even if someone's in a temporary living environment. And services like health at home that might provide home physical therapy or occupational therapy, um, helping to gap the that that um, huge divide between um, someone's function and their environment um, are um, services that um, you can advocate to happen in, in the homeless response um, system um, if you have safe spaces for them to work. And then on the service provider level, um, really supporting people to use some compensatory strategies so that they can take care of themselves. So thinking about how do you fill those gaps if someone has a hard time navigating on their own? So, you know, can you advocate and help um, to, uh, help support someone getting pill boxes or medication organizers from their pharmacy if they have complicated medication um, regimens? You're not going to be managing their medicines for them, but you can make sure that they have the skills and, and the organized support um, to, to be able to, to manage themselves with their, with your support. Um, figure out systems, to, uh, appointment reminder systems or other key reminders that someone might need to, to engage in their health man, healthcare management um, activities. And then really helping individuals identify priorities for their health. Oftentimes when, when someone has a lot of complex um, medical conditions, um, people need to decide which what do I want to focus on first and what is most important to me um, to work on and helping individuals identify those priorities. And then with their permission, acting like as a liaison to medical teams to uh, both let them know I'm noticing this, this has changed, or you know, the, this this individual may not be able to fully express themselves but this is what they told me matters the most. And then just plugging again, the importance of engaging in advanced care planning discussions. Um, and really, this is something that um, I think every member of every team can do. It's really about identifying with someone what's important to them, what are their values, what makes them who they are, so that those things can be shared with other team members if they're not ever not able to, dis to um, explain on their own. Before I move on to behavioral health needs, I want to pause and see if anyone has any questions about this section. So, as everyone here knows, behavioral health is really a broad term that encompasses um, the recognition and the treatment of both mental health and substance use disorders. And this includes the promotion of mental health, resilience and well-being, the treatment of mental health and substance use disorders, and the support of those who are experienced or are in recovery from these conditions. Um, and when we think of the population of individuals experiencing homelessness, the relationship between that experience and behavioral health needs is really complex and bidirectional. And for many behavioral health conditions can contribute to why a person became homeless or behavioral health conditions may begin after someone becomes housed or behavioral health conditions may be exacerbated by the stress of homelessness. And really then there is this um, sort of cyclical and reinforcing um, experience between trauma, 
the experience of homelessness, and then behavioral health symptoms and challenges. And then when we're thinking about older adults who may have a lot of physical um, uh, physical health needs, there is also a strong relationship between physical health and behavioral health symptoms. Um, and similar to what we talked about with functioning, um, uh, behavioral health, uncontrolled behavioral health symptoms can also lead to poor health. So some mental health challenges for older adults. Um, you know, I, whenever I talk about mental health or substance use, I, I always start with stigma. And um, stigma is, um, uh, reinf is, is people who experience homelessness experience so many different layers of stigma. People are stigmatized for their homelessness. People are stigmatized in our society for um, being older age, uh, for, for being older, for not being able to fully care for themselves. And then if there are mental health challenges on top of that, that's just another layer of stigma that then um, may limit someone's ability and comfort in asking for help. Um, People who are older are experiencing new medical diagnoses. And as I mentioned, this can lead to um, new behavior, new or worsening behavioral health symptoms. Um, and medications um, as someone ages may change how they work or they may have new side effects. And then there's also an overlap between cognitive issues and, and dementia and, um, and um and mental health symptoms. So all of these make supporting mental health challenges in older adults even more complicated than in the general population. When we think about substance use in older adults, there is also the issue of stigma. And um, I think that there's the additional um, level of stigma that people experience from people who say, I can't believe someone who is an older adult is still using substances. And that's a choice that, um, and, and I think that too reinforces someone's ability to engage around support. Um, substance use and health also have uh, interactive effect um, as well as um, impacts on cognitive status. And what I think is a really, um, what can impact people at, at any age, but really is very pronounced as people are older and have complex medical conditions, is that if someone is using a substance that um, has a withdrawal syndrome, fear of withdrawal and fear of being stigmatized and mistreated in the hospital can act as a real deterrent for someone seeking medical care when they need it. For someone who is interested in seeking treatment or cutting back on their substance use or changing their pattern of use, there's a lack of age appropriate and cohort concordant treatment options, which sometimes makes it really hard for someone who's older and interested in treatment to feel comfortable, welcome, and um, and uh, in, in a program. And um, functional status requirements, um, the need for someone to engage in chores, to be able to walk upstairs, all of these things um, on, a, on a functional level may act as barriers for seeking treatment for someone who is, is interested in substance use treatment. And then finally, as it is the case with anyone who's experiencing homelessness, but with this really vulnerable population, for those who are transitioning to housing and moving from substance use in a congregate setting where other people are around um, to um, potentially using substances on their own, there's really a high risk of overdose in the transition to um, housing. And then similar to cognitive, to cognitive impairment and people with behavioral health conditions, um, there are really a limited number of higher support placement options for individuals who are older and, um, and still interested in continuing to use substances. So here are some strategies, both on the program level and on the individual level to support individuals who have behavioral health needs. So on the program level, really focusing on creating low barrier, no wrong door models of care um, that meet people where they are. And um, and to really, you know, taking a, a sort of a laser view on, on one of the challenges is really thinking about advocating for placements for individuals who need hospice or end of life care that meets them where they're at um, and supports their need, even if they're not interested in abstinence or a change in how they're managing their behavioral symptoms. And then on the service provider level, um, individuals with behavioral health needs, especially those who are older adults who may have um, been um, supported by the system, disappointed by the system for many, many years, um, increase, increase 
the frequency of engagement, meeting people where they are at, and integrating peers and individuals with lived expertise into the team who can who can really build um, relationships is a key way to, to connect with people. I think making sure that all staff are educated about the different behavioral health conditions and symptoms so that they understand where people um, are coming from, and then embracing a person-centered harm reduction approach. So many of these provider level um, uh, tools are the same ones that you use for, for the general population. And there's no reason to think that harm reduction strategies that support um, individuals um, at all ages wouldn't also be appropriate for older adults. Again, I'll pause here and see if anyone has questions about this part of the talk. So in general, when, when I think about supporting um, uh, people experiencing homelessness, um, and I think about the sort of multidisciplinary healthcare for the homeless model of care, we um, have the components of like person-centered care and harm reduction, trauma-informed care, low barrier access, uh, multidisciplinary care. And this is all of the um, ways that people function within the, um, the homeless response system. When you get into the field of geriatrics or older adults, there's another model that I like to layer on top of the HCH model of care, which is called the 4Ms framework for age-friendly healthcare systems. And um, while this model of care has been designed for um, traditional clinics, um, I think that really um, the model helps me think about supporting older adults, no matter the setting. And the four M's in this model is what matters. So um, aligning care with each older adults um, with their care preferences in mind. Um, the second M is medication is really considering the ways in which medications are are a complicating factor in people's lives and can either help or hurt them depending on um, whether or not how they're taking them. Mentation, that is that question around cog cognitive capability and mobility. Can people safely move around so that they can actually take care of what matters to them and engage in what matters to them? And while again, this initial framework is designed for uh, health systems or a healthcare, traditional healthcare setting, I like to think about the ways in which these four ends are actually really relevant to those of us providing care across um, social service um, setting. So in mobility and helping individuals move safely, I just have a couple of examples of how this is relevant to sort of work we're doing, um, you know, in, in many different settings. So for example, mobility, um, a shelter staff notes that a resident struggles to access a lower bunk and then um, helps them um, uh, helps them move um, to a different um place in the shelter so that they can get in and out of bed safely. Or a community health worker um, helps navigate um, a client through the process of getting an electronic wheelchair. Those are two examples of how we really thinking about mobility and how important it is for people to move safely, things that we do for people in the community. On the mutation level, um, identifying and managing behavioral health systems, uh, symptoms and cognitive decline, you know, uh, I always think that those working in the community are the first people to notice when there's a change in status, whether or not it's behavioral health symptoms, whether it's cognitive status, um, whether it's um, a change in substance use patterns. So for example, a peer at a, a syringe access program notices that a participant is getting lost going to the bathroom and, and flags that for, um, for um, nursing staff um, that they might partner with who comes in once a week or a benefits coordinator um, who is helping people sign up for or insurance sets aside extra time to help a client complete their paperwork because they have a hard time um, navigating the process on their own. In terms of um, med the medication sphere, which is the one that I always think is the most like medically specific, um, there's so much that community support to do to help people around, people who need to take medications um, do so um, safely. So for example, a care manager who's joining an individual at their PCP appointment and with their permission explains how this person is having challenges taking medication and really shifts how, how the um, uh, medical provider um, understands what is possible um, for this person or a peer navigator helping an individual pick up their weekly pillbox and reminding them um, how, it's, how it works. 
And then this last one of what matters is really, I think, the, the heart and soul of everything, which is um, really understanding what someone's goals and preferences are, um, both so that we can support them in real time and we can make sure that we understand what next steps they might want. So an example is a peer navigator listening supportively to someone as they share their new colon cancer diagnosis and their ambivalence about treatment or helping someone um, reconnect with estranged family. Now, a couple of other key resources and partner, partners and suggestions that I want to just throw out there to make sure that folks are aware of. Um, you know, there is a growing movement of medical respite programs. These are medically supported shelters um, with, um, with additional support. Um, services on site. Um, uh, they are growing and they're a great place to provide support to older adults um, uh, to have a safe space to do these workup, to do these functional works up, workups, these cognitive workups, linkages to resources, um, making partnerships with um, local older adult agencies and really trying to bridge that gap between the homeless response system and the older adult um, agencies in your um, community. Um, and then also developing internal agency champions who's for familiar with local resources for older adults. And then the last one that I'll say the third time this talk is really developing those comfort and having those advanced care planning discussions, um, and then assisting in completion of formal paperwork when people are interested and possible, and, um, and when it's possible. Now, I, I do want to say that this, um, this work um, is really hard because I just highlighted all of the ways in which um, older adults who are experiencing homelessness have these unique needs and support needs, um, support needs, and our systems are often not up to up to speed and haven't um, met us met us and, and allow us to. Um, to have all the resources we need to fully um, support people. And this can lead um, when we have sort of that, that disparity or that, that separation between what we wish, the resources we wish we had to offer someone and what we actually do can, can lead to moral distress or moral injury. And we're often in a situation um, where we are trying to balance both what we have available, but also um, what we wish for someone and then what they wish for themselves. And really thinking about this um, balance um, and this tug um, in this population between our desire to support independence, our desire to offer more support, and then the realities of what's available for us to um, offer someone. So I wanted to um, um, sort of summarize this with a, a quote from another one of my colleagues about how um, how she thinks about this tension um, uh, in the clients that she serves. So I have such a clear picture of a number of folks over the years for who retaining their independence and agency was number one. Even if that means for them accepting significant risks of accidental death or related illness, uh, injury, but that idea of agency and feeling respected as a person seems to trump everything. If you're 55 or 60 and you've been homeless for 20 or 30 years, you have developed so many survival skills that it might seem to staff that you can't possibly live independently. I think we have to really parse out and not just go to they're not safe. Rather, try to see what the trade-offs are and really think carefully about how to support people, either aging in place or just letting them do what they want to do and, you know, live the way they want to live their lives. I think it's really important that they have people either in the medical system or the social system that know them extremely well. And that's who you are, the people who know people extremely well. So um, summarizing or ending um, with just some guiding principles um, for providers supporting older adults to help us get through those moments when, when it's hard and when there is that tension is that um, as, as service providers, we can really accept people who they are without question or requirement. We can understand that someone is an authority on their own life and that our job isn't to answer for them, even if they're older and starting to have impairments. We understand that participants may make decisions that we don't agree with, but it doesn't impact their validity or their rightness. And it's our job to become familiar with an individual's goals and respect that these may change over time. And that a person's decision are not about you or the or reflection of how important you are in their life, um, but that we have, um, but we can choose how we respond to those tensions.
And then, you know, just as my last slide, some strategies that program can programs can do to support staff because this work with older adults experiencing illness is really rewarding, but also can be very hard. Um, so some of the things that programs um, and and it can be expansive because we don't have all of the resources ideally we would want. So some um, strategies that programs can can use to support staff is to really encourage um, and support boundary settings, keeping work at work, making sure that people are um, not working more than their time or being asked to do things outside of um, their work hours, and then really um, appreciating staff and supporting their wellness and well-being. Um, I think that regular and structured case conferencing to discuss difficult cases and um, to share resources and new resources and, and celebrate successes um, is really important. And then to do staff training like, like this one um, to make sure that, um, that staff have the skills, the knowledge, and the resources um, to feel like they're doing a really great job supporting people. With that, I will stop and see if there are questions um, or comments. I, I will stick around, but it was such a um, uh, pleasure to be here with all of you today, and I hope that some of these ideas are helpful. Um, we have a number, I think you're going to um, get the, have the pleasure of hearing one of my colleagues in uh, your next session, and we have a number of trainings around trauma-informed care um, and um, uh, behavioral health um, also on our website if you are interested in, in learning more about some of the support resources. Thank you, Devora. You've given us a lot of really good information that there's a lot to unpack in there. You've given us a lot in a short amount of time. Thank you. Um, just want to remind everybody that an evaluation should pop up shortly after you sign out of the training. So please complete that and check our website, the coalition's website in a few days. Uh, if you want to see a recording this presentation if you want to watch it again or if you want to share it with somebody and I will send out copies of the slides to everybody. Devora has agreed to do that so she's going to send that to me and I'll send that out to everybody. The next community table is not virtual. It is in-person tenant landlord rights and responsibilities with Rebecca Cotton from Legal Aid. That is a week from today and just a note if you've been attending Bagels in the Basement on the first Friday of every other month. The next one will not be on October the 4th because of St. James um, Art Festival. It's gonna be on the um, 11th. So you should have gotten receipts, uh, invitation for that. So again, thank you for coming. Thank you for your participation and um, we'll see you next time.